Hey, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming here. And uh, we're really excited to have Dahlia Lithwick back in Charlottesville. Thanks for being here. Okay, Dahlia and Amy Woolard are going to be on stage in just a few minutes. But first, as most of you know, this event was organized by the Charlottesville Democrats. And we would be remiss if we didn't at least mention that there's a very important election coming up <laughs> in roughly 46 days, something like that. So the incumbent is an extremely Trumpy Republican named Bob Good. Yes, you're, I, I think this is an astute crowd. Um, and we have a very hardworking Democrat who is working very, very hard to unseat Bob Good. And there's at least a few things that I thought it was important to share with this group about Josh Thronberg. He supports abortion and reproductive rights. He believes that climate change must be addressed. He favors common sense gun safety legislation. He does not support Virginia whitewashing history. He supports LBGT, uh, LBGTQ plus rights. And, and finally, I'm going to mention one last one. This, this is going to sound kind of wacky. He supports women's rights. So if this sounds like someone that you'd like to see in Congress to replace Bob Good, then please give a warm, rousing welcome to our candidate, and I hope your candidate, Josh Thronberg. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Josh Thronberg. The last time I was in this theater, it was January of 2020. Pre-pandemic, my neighbor's daughter, who was in fifth grade, was in Frozen. And we were, uh, we were cheering from the crowd, sitting next to each other, thinking nothing of what was about to come. Thank you so much for having me here. I I'd like to just start with two quick questions. Uh, by a raise of hands... How many of you consider yourself to be politically engaged, politically active? Do you mind raising a lot of hands in the, in the audience? That's, and Nancy Damon with two hands up, so that's, <laughs> that's fair. Uh, second question. Before you got out of your car tonight and started walking up to the door and saw Nancy with my sign in front of you, how many of you had heard of me before? Oh, this is the... Good job, Charlottesville Albemarle. Fantastic. So, um, if you are someone who hasn't, a brief introduction to myself. Uh, I live here in Charlottesville with my wife and my two daughters. Uh, I met my wife in South Korea. She's Korean-Canadian-American. So, she was born in South Korea, grew up in Niagara Falls, Canada, and then immigrated to the U.S. when we got married. My oldest daughter is Lucy. She's thir uh, 12, 13, and two weeks um, born in Haiti right before the 2010 earthquake. We adopted her after that earthquake and brought her back. And our second daughter, Agnes, just turned seven. Biological, biracial, a little more of a normal story there. And the reason that I got into this race is twofold. Number one, I look towards the future and the trajectory of so many things in our country, in our planet. Um, and as a father, it's terrifying. If we don't make decisions now, be it climate, be it democracy, be it racism, be it sexism, then generations will struggle and suffer beyond us. That's the, that's the, that's the first reason I got in. And the second reason was um, I hoped I could win <laughs> was, was the second reason. Um, in 2020, we ran an incredible candidate here in the 5th District, but we still lost. And, and I, I sat on my back porch that night, and I wondered, well, if this candidate doesn't win, 
who can win? What does that candidate look like? And I don't know that that candidate necessarily looks like me, but there are some pieces to my story. I'm an ordained minister, and there are a lot of folks in the middle and on the right who um, connect with that. There, I'm a, I grew up on a farm, and this is a rural district. I, I grew up in a conservative family, so I speak that language even though I have turned very far away from so many of the policies that inhabit that language. And so I hoped that I would be able to go out and connect with a district that is very diverse. What we have here in Charlottesville, the Albemarle County around it, is wonderful, and my wife and I love living here, but it's not representative of the fullness of this district. And we have to actually win this district, not just win this city or this county. We have to actually go out, go out and win this district. And so that's what we have been working hard to do. I just crossed over 40,000 miles on my car in the last year because we have been driving all over the place, spending time here, spending time down in Mecklenburg and Halifax and Pennsylvania and Danville and everywhere in between because what is at stake this year is incredible. Um, I, and I, I don't mean to bash any other person, but just from a performance perspective, my opponent is a threat to so many different kinds of people. If you are a woman, he's a threat. If you are gay, he's a threat. If you are, um, if you're a veteran, he's a threat. If you're a police officer, he's, if you, you can go on and on and on and on and over and over, he votes against the interests of so many people. And so there is so much on the line, and I'm I'm hoping that I can ask all of you to, to perhaps do three things to help us win. I, I want to just say quickly, this district is hard, but we only lost by 5.5% in the last election. And if you've been watching the special congressional elections over the last two months, every single one of them has outperformed Joe Biden's 2020 performance by five or six points. If that alone happens in our district, this is a neck and neck race. And then it just becomes who can get out there, who can drive out the vote. And, and I'm hoping that all of you will be a part. So three things you can do. Number one, early voting starts tomorrow. It, it is here. And we want to thank our incredible Democratic state legislature that made that happen, right? That expanded so many voting rights. It's an unbelievable thing. So November 8th may be election day, but you can go tomorrow. You can join me at 10 a.m. If you're a Charlottesville resident, come down to the Freedom Wall right outside the registrar office. We're going to gather. We're going to celebrate. We're going to have a lot of fun. My wife made scones. There are dozens and dozens of scones on my kitchen table. And, and if you've had my wife's scones, you know that's enough of a reason to come down tomorrow. Um, we're going to vote. My wife and I are going to go in and we're going to vote and we're going to celebrate that. That's one thing you can do. The second thing is you can volunteer for our campaign. Go out, knock on doors, make phone calls, send texts, put up a sign in your yard, talk to your neighbors, do everything that you can between now and election day to try to bring as many votes in as possible. There is no president on the ballot. There is no senator on the ballot. It is Josh Thronberg and Bob Good. And whoever of us can drive out the most votes in November takes this thing home and goes to Washington, D.C. to represent all of you. So the second thing you can do is volunteer. The last thing you can do is you can give money to this campaign. I'm so grateful that so many of you in this room know who I am. But if you're living in Appomattox County right now, you don't. And unless we're able to fund the necessary resources to go out, and, and we made beautiful commercials on Tuesday, but if we don't, we don't get to show them, they won't do any good. And so if you are able and willing to write a check, go on to Act Blue, make a contribution, it could make, uh, if you think through how this all plays out over the next two months, it could make an incredible difference. And so I'm so grateful for the time. I'm so grateful for the Charlottesville uh, committee and for Dan and all the work that he put into this. Thank you for giving me time tonight to be here. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. There's a lot of people in this room that are with you. Okay. Appreciate you coming out tonight. Um, and now I'm going to introduce tonight's two conversationalists. Amy Woolard is a writer and attorney who's lived and worked in Charlottesville for over 30 years, much of which she spent working on civil rights policy and legislation. Most recently serving as director of policy at the Legal Aid Justice Center, Amy is now chief program officer for the ACLU of Virginia. Her debut poetry collection, Neck of the Woods, 
won the Alice James Prize and was published in 2020. And her poems and nonfiction have appeared in such publications as The New Yorker, The Paris Review, Poetry, Boston Review, The Guardian, and Virginia Quarterly Review. Our second conversationalist is Dahlia Lithwick, who is senior legal correspondent at Slate and host of Amicus, Slate's award-winning bi-weekly podcast about the law. Her work has also appeared in the New York Times, Harper's, The New Yorker, The Washington Post, The New Republic, and Commentary, among many other places. Lithwick won a 2013 National Magazine Award for her columns on the Affordable Choice Act, and she was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in October of 2018. As many of you know, Dahlia lived in Charlottesville from 2000 until 2017, and we are so thrilled to welcome her back for this homecoming celebration of her new book. I'm supposed to hold it up here, but I forgot it backstage. <laughs> ah, that, that's the book I was referring to. And her new book entitled Lady Justice, Women, the Law, and the Battle to Save America. Please give it up for Dahlia Lithwick and Amy Woolard. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, right into the mic, yeah. Right into the mic. Mm -hmm. There we go. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think? She's just looking around. I'm taking freaking it all. out right and now. <laughs> hi, hi. It's so good to see everyone. Okay. Hi. Hi. Hi, friend. Hi, friend. I told Dahlia backstage, if at any point I'm just sitting here, like, listening to her and forgetting <laughs> that I'm the one asking the questions, um, somebody just throw something at me. <laughs> so, Lady Justice. Yeah. This is a book I think we've all been waiting for. I think maybe you have been waiting for it, too, <laughs> as much as any of us in different ways. Um, I want to start first just by acknowledging how great it is and how grateful I am to have, at last, a physical manifestation of you, Dahlia Lithwick, <laughs> and this book to celebrate and love and support and devour and learn from. You will not ever say this yourself, but the communities you've created on social media, if any of you are on her Facebook page, you know this, in your columns, in your neighborhoods, you shoulder a lot of our anxieties and questions and really buoy people um, in dark times. And that is hard, exhausting work. And I'm so thrilled to have a forum to really celebrate you and give some of that energy back to you. Um, and I want to thank all of you for being here to do it with me. Thank you. Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have your book out here, or do you need to use it? No, one? I'm going to need yours. Okay. <laughs> um, so you call the first chapter of Lady Justice the beginning, but you truly begin the book with a quote from Polly Murray, who is my favorite poet lawyer. Um, and because, among other things, it made me think about efforts here in Virginia and across the country to both tell the full truth and history of justice movements in our schools and the strong efforts to suppress that truth and history. Can you read that epigram for us? And I want to start by asking you to talk to us about who she is and why it was important for you to begin the book with her. Um, let, me, let me start by answering the question and then reading the epigram, if that's okay, because... Um, Polly Murray is the most important, radical, transformational social justice warrior that no one's ever heard of. 
Um, if you have seen the incredible film, My Name is Polly Murray, uh, then you know this. If you have not seen the incredible film, do that. Um, because Polly Murray was almost everything that came after before the person who got credit for that thing. Polly Murray, and I should say, um, Polly Murray strongly uh, uh, self-identified as a man who was kind of stuck in the body of a woman long before there was language for that or acknowledgement of that. So Polly Murray probably would want to be called they uh, in this conversation. Um, Polly Murray, long before Rosa Parks refused to move to the back of the bus, Polly Murray uh, was arrested for refusing to move to the back of the bus long before uh, others were desegregating uh, lunch counters. Polly Murray was desegregating lunch counters uh, long before uh, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was doing foundational 14th Amendment uh, uh, gender equality law. Polly Murray was doing it. And I am obsessed with Polly Murray for the same reason you are, uh, because this non-binary, uh, black person who was on one side descended from slave owners and another side descended from slaves who could not get into uh, the college of their choice because of being black, could not get into the law school of their choice because of being a woman, at every point just kept going. And maybe the most essential thing for my purposes about Polly Murray uh, is that the spine of what became the brief in Brown v. Board of Education was a law school paper that Polly Murray wrote at Howard that was literally used without her consent, without asking. And years later, she found out, oh, yeah, no, that was, in fact, the building blocks of Brown v. Board, and, and it prevailed. And when Ruth Bader Ginsburg went on to file her seminal first um, uh, uh, gender equality cases, to her immense credit, uh, then uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, attorney put Polly Murray's name on the brief uh, as a way of saying, I stand on the shoulders of giants who do not get credit. So that is a long-winded way of saying that for me, this whole book is probing a question of who gets famous and who gets credit, who is known for changing history and who did the work. It's not a knock on Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It's not a knock on Thurgood Marshall that they get immense credit. But I think both Thurgood Marshall, who, by the way, credited Polly Murray with writing the Bible of desegregation, which he kept on his desk uh, at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg were well aware of who had laid down the tracks before. And so I think a lot of this book was written as a kind of extended meditation on why we look for heroes, why we sit around waiting for RBG 2.0 to rise from the dead and lead us to an era of justice. It doesn't work. That's not how democracy works. It's not how justice works. Justice works because people toil in the vineyards, often unrecognized, often for decades. And history may forget them, but this is a book about people who history should not forget. And the armies and armies of people who worked so that they could get where they are. And I think, just to sort of land this plane, for me, it is a very, forgive me for saying, but gendered story about the hero who comes riding in and saves the day. And whether we call that person Robert Mueller or we call that person Adam Schiff or Merrick Garland, it's the way kind of cowboy movies work. It's actually not the way democracy works. And so I, I start with Polly Murray because I think actually women know this in their bones because all of us know grandmothers and great-grandmothers who did that work and don't get credit and don't have mugs and don't have tote bags and don't have 
throw pillows, thank you, Amy, and don't have all the Ruth Bader Ginsburg swag in the world, but who understand who our heroes are. And so this is um, Polly Murray in addition to everything else. And here's why I wanted Amy Willard to be my partner in conversation today, was just an astonishing poet. And this is from uh, a Polly Murray uh, poem called Dark Testament, and it's the epigraph for the book. Freedom is a dream, haunting as amber wine, or worlds remembered out of time. Not Eden's gate, but freedom lures us down a trail of skulls where men forever crush the dreamers, never the dream. Boom, Polly Murray. We can even just stop right there. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night, Charlottesville. Yeah, no, I, she's I, astounding. I love that you talk about imagination too, because I think so many times in, in my work and in policy work, what I see is really a failure of the imagination. We can't even conceive of things being different systemically from how they are. And so I love when we recognize people who are driven by imagination like that. And the fact that you included that, I think it's a thread that runs all the way through this book, um, that the power of the imagination and harnessing that and using that as a tool is how we move forward too. Yeah, and I, and I think, and this is just endure this with me, but I think it's also a thing that just because of gender inequality and centuries of it, that women are sometimes in a position to imagine their way into freedom, imagine kind of aspirational modes of doing justice that are big leaps, and certainly Polly Murray was, you know, I think a, a, an architect of great leaping, but I think that there is real power in uh, the force of imagination when it's kind of lashed to women and judging and democracy and justice, because I think um, often that dream that she's talking about uh, is only a dream until you start to you know, do the work of justice. So I wanna to talk to you, this is, um, this is women in the law, but this is also about organizing. This is an organizing story as much as it is a legal one. And there's always been this kind of, I think, generative tension between lawyers and organizers. And one of the things I appreciate most about you in this book is that you continue to seek to tell the truth about and push on the law in particular and on its students and teachers and practitioners um, for us to be responsive and responsible to that inside work of lawyering and the justice system. Um, you know, these are extraordinary women, but they are working within a system and using a tool that was built without us. It was designed explicitly to oppress us. It's often weaponized, and especially in the case of women of color, to do actual physical, economic, cultural harm to us. Can you talk to us, why is it important for these women, for us maybe too, to continue to work inside of a flawed system? And why was it important for you to tell those stories? You know, some of these women are institutionalists, some are more on the insider outsider spectrum, and especially thinking about Vanita Gupta as a real hinge between these worlds. Um, and she's someone who says she believes in institutions, but she also says litigation doesn't build power. Um, so talk about that tension and that thread. I, I mean, I, <laughs> I often call the answer to this question, and probably some of you heard me say this in 2015 and 2016, but it's the welcome to my nervous breakdown portion of the conversation because I you know, have covered the court for 22 terms. Um, I believe deeply in uh, the rule of law, in the justice system, I believe, believe it or not, with all its flaws in the Constitution. I believe um, that law lifts us up to a better place. And I'm also well aware uh, that the law fails. It buckles. Uh, it doesn't exist. There are places, so many places, that we thought the law was operative that turned out to be norms. 
And there are people in this audience who in 2016 would come to events and say, how can they keep Merrick Garland from having a seat? Isn't there something we can file? Where is the lawsuit for this? And the answer was norms. These were all norms. And the Hatch Act, you know, people in this audience saying, how can... Uh, you know, they violate the Trump, the, the Hatch Act without consequences. And the answer was, the law is not self-enforcing, right? So that was the first part of it, that a lot of what I thought was this immutable, intractable, perfect thing that was trying to get better was just soft norms. And that's uh, the first piece of it. And then the second piece is the really pernicious thing that you just flicked at, Amy, which is... You know, at the end of the Dobbs opinion, um, Justice Alito says, look, women are not without power. Go out there and change things. And this is the same Justice Alito who says the, you know, the word abortion is not in the Constitution. And you are invisible uh, as women. And abortion is invisible. And so what do you do when he's drawing from a constitutional tradition and time in which women had no power, they had no say in the drafting of that document, they were utterly unable to effectuate their will, and for him to go back and not simply cite that those founding documents and those debates, but to go back and say, oh, I'm going to cite Sir Matthew Hale, beloved witch burner. And, you know, that is a more important place to land than uh, uh, the women who were carved out of that bargain. And you're exactly right. There is a tension that absolutely works its way through this book because it's working its way through me, which is what do you do when you're kind of a captive to, <laughs> I think, who said it to me today? Emily Bazelon in an interview, my, my colleague at Slate said, this is a book about law as a bad boyfriend. You know, like you're just stuck in this abusive relationship with this creature that is the author of your misery. And you have been trying to carve out of the rock face of the law for 200 years something resembling dignity and equality and fairness. And the bad boyfriend is just like, oops, just kidding. And it's true. I mean, that is something that I have felt so strongly. I mean, it, it pops up so many times in the book. And so you're exactly right. One of the questions I asked each of the subjects as I interviewed them was like, how do you reconcile the fact that you have this crazy kind of Patty Hearst syndrome where you are in love to an institution that really kind of hates you a lot of the time? And more than that, and you said this, but I think it's important post Dobbs, it's not just that that institution hates you, it's that it can be used to put you in jail. And if you don't believe me, look at what's going on this week in Iran. And so I just think we have to sit in that tension of simultaneously holding in our minds that the law is the thing that brings us equality and justice, and thank God for it, because the alternative is fighting in the streets. And I am super bad at, you know, like punching and kicking. And so... The law is the thing, right? You have your blue book and your yellow pad. You know this better than anyone, and you can get justice. But at the same time, in a heartbeat, it can be used to put women in Alabama in prison so that they cannot endanger their fetus. It can be used to put a young woman in Oklahoma in prison because of allegations that she harmed her fetus. So every one of these women is living in that tension, Amy, and every one of them kind of comes out, as you say, with a different answer, Becca Heller, who is young and brash and doesn't really believe in institutions, simply dismisses it as I'm using, you know, the master's tools to destroy the master's house. End story. This is what I have. I'm well aware that this entire justice system in this country is freighted with racism and misogyny, but this is what I have. And then you're quite right. You know, you have Anita Hill, of all people, who absolutely puts her faith and says so eloquently, you know, without law, it's chaos. Without law, it's violence. And so I put my faith in this deeply flawed justice system, which, by the way, has deserved her, and says, this is, this is what we have, and so this is what I work to repair. And you're exactly right that at the center of all that, you know, and I think it's at the center of the book quite deliberately, is Vanita Gupta, 
who at the time that I wrote the book and interviewed her was at the leadership conference, is now number three in Merrick Garland's Justice Department, but who really thinks on that theme of kind of the law as something deeply flawed, eminently fixable, but at the moment being used to do horrific harm, and also the law is the engine of everything that is good and just from Brown v. Board to Obergefell. And so there's no satisfying answer. And I think maybe the book is a map of my nervous breakdown in which, you know, the Venn diagrams of how each of these characters struggles with that question, which is, as you say, existential for us as lawyers. And they all land on different places. And I, I slightly hope that when people read, they will find their way to their own sense of either somebody whose answer is satisfying or, you know, a loftier, better answer even than these people give us. But I think it is very much the sort of issue of our time uh, in the law is that we are living in a moment where the law has made us both unimaginably free and unimaginably imperiled. Yeah, I think when I was, just, I told you this backstage, I was really especially struck by your chapter on Anita Hill. And for someone, for everything that she's been through, for her to continue to say, I believe in institutions, without law there is chaos, and to come back again and again and again, I feel like I'm going to lean on that a lot <laughs> in my career. Um, if she can say that, you know, um, to really think about that. And these are stories that are really personal to so many of us. Um, for every one woman you profile, as you say, there are thousands upon thousands standing all around them. But I was also struck throughout the book, um, and I feel like you struggle with this a little bit yourself, being a journalist and being um, seeing yourself in these stories quite literally. Um, I was struck by just how extraordinarily and specifically these stories are personal to you in particular, you know, we were both here in Charlottesville when Trump's travel ban came down, our colleagues and friends, maybe some people in this room, um, were among those who rushed to Dulles and courthouses here in Virginia. Um, you were literally in the room when many of the decisions you talk about um, were being argued. Um, you and I, and I'm guessing many of us here tonight, were here in Charlottesville during all the events of Unite the Right. And of course, your chapter on Alex Kaczynski um, and then speaking about leaving the court after the Kavanaugh hearings is you sharing yourself inside this book with a vulnerability like no other point um, I've seen from you. And I know that was um, a really important experience for you to be able to say some of those things out loud. Can you talk a little bit about your personal relationship to this material? Did writing the book change you or surprise you in any way? You know, if you had a Facebook relationship status with the Supreme Court? Are you at it's complicated? Are you at <laughs> we're broken up? Um, um, yeah, I mean, listen, you know me well enough to know there are many people in this room who know me well enough to know that I hate writing about myself. Um, for many, many years, my sort of party trick in covering the Supreme Court was just to be kind of dispassionate and funny, right? I was like the, the, the hip, cool, young person on a beat where the average age was older than me. And this was a beat where, like, I mean, Lyle Denniston <laughs> covered the court until he was, you know, late 80s and still is tweeting. And, you know, like, nobody leaves this beat. And so um, when I came in and I was like, oh, look at me, I'm young and funny and wry and ironic and like can make, you know, jokes about at the time, 1999, I'd make jokes about like the show Friends or whatever was happening, like that kids today are like, what now? So, um, but I just was able to have this like very dispassionate wry distance and that was, you know, very comfortable and safe for me. And then as you say, 2017, for me, for all, many of us, changed everything uh, in a whole bunch of ways. And in very weird ways, like I really was the Where's Waldo of a whole bunch of bad, bad things that happened in the short of a, in the span of a very short time. So, you know, went from, from uh, Unite the Right and then uh, ended up 
for those who don't know what Amy's referring to, basically me tooing a federal judge uh, in print in ways that were incredibly difficult for me, which I talk about in the book, um, and ended up um, sitting in the Kavanaugh hearings while Christine Blasey Ford was testifying and while then judge, now Justice Kavanaugh, um, was smashing his binder and shouting and yelling at Amy Klobuchar. And, you know, throughout all these events, I kept looking around and the witness to it was me. Um, and then I found that time and time again, this idea of being funny or being kind of dispassionate and distant and cool and millennial or, you know, whatever I was trying to be, hip, uh, was not going to work, was not going to serve. And I think my journalism changed. I started getting very grumpy letters when I would go on SNBC and people would say, you know, dear Ms. Lithwick, I liked you better when you were funny. Um, <laughs> 2017 seems to be the year you stopped smiling. I was like, yeah, a lot of us stopped smiling. Thank you. Um, so, so I think the answer is, um, and I tell the story in the book, and many of you know my son, Kobe. Um, some of you raised him. Um, some of you really raised him better than I did. And um, there's a moment in the book right before I'm about to hit publish on a story about Judge Alex Kaczynski, who was kind of well-known, open secret on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals for showing porn to his law clerks, for speaking in really explicit sexual ways to them over decades and decades, and everyone knew this. And uh, two w women came forward and put their names uh, in the Washington Post and said, we are prepared to now say uh, that he did this to us. And Judge Kaczynski's response at the time was to belittle one of them uh, for being a romance novelist. Um, so sit with that for a minute, because we started with Polly Murray, poet, uh, and Amy Willard, poet. Um, and I was, I just had to decide whether I was going to write what I had known for 20 years um, about him. And I wrote it, and I, it was all fact-checked multiple times. Um, and then uh, I <laughs> was in Florida giving a speech, uh, and I was about to hit you know, Slate was about to publish it, and I was, uh, thought I was having a heart attack. I was standing outside a clinic, um, getting ready to check myself in <laughs> because I thought I was, you know, going to have a heart attack. And my son Kobe called, and he is not uh, the kid who would usually say something tender, but he said, I know you don't want to tell your story. I know you don't want to write about you. I know you think it's, you know, fun and cool to make jokes about the Supreme Court justices, but sometimes you do have to tell your own story so that other women can tell theirs. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Tandem, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> he, he, was, he, was, he was in the care and custody uh, of Tandem for, that made him, in many ways, uh, the, the good feminist he is. That led me to... Um, to just feel as though, and this is, sorry, this is a, such a circuitous answer, but that so much of what I was dealing with, the material in here about vulnerability, about pain, about violence, about women being resilient despite horrifying setbacks, so much of this had inflected my own thinking, that if I didn't kind of come forward and talk about some of the ways this affected me, um, I was not being truthful, and I was demanding it of my subjects. And so there is material in this book that makes me intensely uncomfortable, and like when you read it, just forget it, but, um, and never discuss it with me. But I think uh, it was a real lesson, again, in women and storytelling and power and law, because I think, you know, going back to Polly Murray, who was a poet, you have to be able to like sometimes open a vein and show what you are and show your pain. And so I, you know, didn't do it comfortably. Um, but I think that in order to tell your story, in order for other people to tell your story, sometimes you have to tell your own. And I think we, we see some of that through each of these chapters where all of these women take personal risk, and all of them connect to collective action. All of them took a public stand, yourself included, 
um, in ways that put their reputations, their careers, their families, their safety at risk. And in so many of these issues, it seems we need massive collective action in spite of personal risk. And you have this, um, it's your quote, but you're talking about Stacey Abrams. And you say, she told a story that would set the stage for a 2020 election in Georgia and across the nation in which millions of Americans who never had the experience of voting while black could finally both imagine what that was like and prepare themselves to do so. Can you talk about how we bring more people to the point of understanding the personal protections they enjoy and help them understand the threat that implicates them too, and that we need more personal risk, but what we really need is that collective action? Yeah, and it, a little bit of it goes back to imagination, right, where you started, because I think, and you know, I always think of um, Sherilyn Eiffel, who was the head of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund uh, until just this spring. And uh, she came on my podcast for New Year's of this past year and gave one of those kind of, you know, the John Belushi speech from like Animal House that was the most like single most rousing, inspiring, you know, speech I've ever heard. And one of the things she reminded me is, you know, A, we're all focused on January 6th. Let's think for a minute about January 5th because the single most astonishing thing happened, which is a black man and a Jewish man got elected in Georgia despite massive vote suppression, despite massive, massive um, lock, lack of confidence in the election and voting, and in a massive act of faith, people organized and they went out in a pandemic, and they voted. And that's the story that starts the January 6th story, right? That, but for that story of triumph and organizing and imagination and compassion, and she's really, really focused when she says this on what it means to have a black man and a Jewish man in the South working together in the finest tradition of the civil rights movement, right? And at this point, I'm weeping and crying and like waving. And, and then she says this really urgent thing, which is the reason people go out for Black Lives Matter marches um, after, uh, you know, in, in the middle of a pandemic and they risk their lives, the reason they vote is compassion, is empathy, that people saw what they didn't know and they showed up. And I think one of the things that is so essential to me is understanding that while a lot of people were shocked and horrified when Dobbs came down in June, if you were a black woman in the South, you never had a real right to abortion. If you were a black woman in Mississippi, you had a paper right to abortion after the Hyde Amendment, after clinics closed, I mean, Amy knows this, Amy Hagstrom Miller knows this better than anyone, that you weren't losing something with Dobbs because you never had it. And by the same token, Professor Carol Anderson told me before the 2016 election, uh, the same thing. If you are shocked that you are standing in line for four hours in Georgia at a polling place where half of the, the, the precinct is voting on broken machines and you are being harassed for your ID, then you have never voted while black. And Every time I hear that, every single time I hear that, and so many of the people, as you say in this book, remind me that if you lived in a world where you are shocked by voter suppression, if you live in a world where you are shocked by Dobbs, then you just don't live in a world where you see exactly what's going on around you. And there has been an immense leveling that is happening now. And with that leveling, with the understanding that, and uh, President Obama said this in the 2020 election, like pretty much everyone now has to go out and vote the way people of color, the way Native Americans, the way immigrants uh, have voted in this country forever. Now everybody has to do that. Welcome to my America. And I think by the same token, women now have to understand uh, that what we are experiencing in the half of the states that are going to have, you know, trigger laws and abortion bans is that that was very much the case in Mississippi all along. And so that's depressing. I'm sorry. But the good news is that is where empathy and imagination and compassion come in. And part of, I think, the opportunity is to take that and to say, 
Just because a thing isn't happening to you doesn't mean it's not happening. And that has been, I think, a sea change that we have seen in this country. It's why Kansas happened. It's why Michigan happened. It's why Alaska happened. It's why that special election in New York happened. Is because I think for the first time, knowing that women have to get sepsis or bleed out on a table before they can be treated is something that we can imagine happening to us. And that's power. That is huge power. And I think that's the thing that Vanita Gupta in her chapter about organizing talks about, is building power, lasting power. It's not enough to win lawsuits. You can win all the lawsuits in the world, but you have to win power. And I think the key to power is empathy, and it is the willingness to understand in great humility that you don't know what you don't know, but you're willing to hear it, and then you're willing to act. And I really think that that is a moment that we are at I deeply believe that, and for me to produce an optimistic book, I mean, <laughs> my producer calls me Broken Tigger, right? Because I used to be the bounciest, happiest podcaster in human history, and now I'm just like, every single podcast is just like, hello, <laughs> I guess I'm here at Knife Point again, telling you we're doomed. But I really, I, I say all that and I say with great, great candor, I think humility and the willingness to hear and see what you don't know is what is going to absolutely rocket us into action. So now is that point in the evening, I, I don't want to share you, but they tell me I have to share you with our amazing audience um, to hear their questions and their adoration for you. Before we do that, though, um, I want applause and shouts and Muppet dances in celebration <laughs> of Dahlia Lithwick and this amazing book and the incredible gift she is and has been to Charlottesville. <laughs> and They won't stop applauding. I know. Um, I think Dan's going to take over now. Well, just no? we, we've got some logistics I okay. have to communicate, and then uh, Q&A is coming in just a few minutes. Um, what a great conversation. This is being recorded by the really nice folks at PVCC, and uh, for friends and relatives of yours that you want to uh, suggest they see uh, Amy and Dahlia in action, it's going to be on the website, hopefully by the end of tomorrow. Um, so we did save time for audience Q&A, and there are two microphones set up on either side. So if people have questions, you can start moving toward those microphones. Um, we do have a request that you ask kind of short, direct questions, and not... Uh, that they are actual questions and not uh, well, a comment or, in the form or of Or anecdotes, if you took a yoga class with Dahlia 20 years ago, we're interested in that too, but perhaps less. Um, so anyway, short questions. You can start queuing up at the uh, microphones. Um, while people are moving to the microphones, um, the Charlottesville Dems did want to take a minute and recognize the many nonprofits in our area who are working in the areas that uh, Dahlia uh, profiles so nicely in the book. and. Um, a quick legal disclaimer here, these are organizations that are neither affiliated with the Democratic Party nor necessarily endorse our policy positions. Is that legal enough, you think? Okay. Um, so having said that, um, please hold your applause to the end when I read through all the names of the organizations. Um, these organizations couldn't have a representative here tonight. Uh, International Neighbors, International Rescue Committee, Jefferson School African American Heritage Center, Planned Parenthood South Atlantic, Shelter for Help in Emergency, and Virginia Organizing. Uh, but organizations that do have representatives here tonight, um, I'll read the name of the organization and uh, the representative, and uh, they'll stand up so you can see who is here. And again, hold your applause to the end. Um, Blue Ridge Abortion Fund, uh, Deborah Ehrenstein, Director of Development. 
I'll hold, hold your applause to the end, just to equal opportunity. Uh, Charlottesville NOW, uh, Charlottesville Now, excuse me, Amy Laufer, VP of Community Development. Um, League of Women Voters, Sue Lewis, former president. The Sexual Assault Resources Agency, Renee Branson, executive director. And Sin Barreras, Edgar Lara, executive director. Uh, go ahead and stand up, all of you, and uh, please let's give them a big hand. So after, after the event is over tonight, uh, now that you know these people on you know, a very personal face recognition basis, if you want to talk to them about the organization, um, they'll be happy to talk with you afterwards. Um, so okay, we have some people at the microphone now. I'm going to turn things back over to Amy and Dahlia. And we have 20 minutes of Q&A. So those short, direct questions are really appreciated. Take it away, guys. In case you missed it, short, direct questions, right? My, my, my version of this is to just say it's very much better if it ends with a question. Yeah. Just, just make your voice go up at the end like we do in court. And good. Like, isn't that true? Is is it duly warned. Yeah. <laughs> so we start over here. Hi. I just um, was also very shocked about the, the rights of women and everybody being just totally uh, ignored all of a sudden. Suddenly for me. Uh, because I'm 66. But what I want to say is I'm also a registered nurse, and I've worked in many capacities, administrative, hospitals, that sort of thing. When we had a, a physician, you know, uh, who was a governor, and it was so timely, right? What I'm going to, I'm going to make this real quick, but I'm leaning toward the question, which is, how does DeSantis or anybody else become an authority on medical? Uh, and how did that become a law? And this is the thing that is topsy-turvy for me because I have always had to practice the, you know, the standards of practice according to my certification. Every single year we had to get recertified or whatever we did. And here are these governors without any medical or whatever. Okay, so you understand what I'm saying and can you please help me? I mean, do you want to take a crack on the, the, the Virginia component of that? And then I will Not take it. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Not even in this life. No, I mean, I, I think it, I think the, her question speaks to um, a lot of what the women in your book are up against in their particular battles, too, which is people who have been making decisions um, often for women, often for women of color for a very long time who don't have the background, who have been um, congratulated and moved up most of their lives um, without much question. And, you know, I think the Kavanaugh story in your book is a huge example of that, too, um, where these are very powerful positions. Um, and how do you challenge that? And, 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 and you know, I would, I would add one gloss to that, which is, one of the many ways in which I was dumb is that um, when the Dobbs leak happened in May, rife with medical error, rife with historical error, I mean, being fact-checked in real time by actual historians, actual economists saying these are the 10,000 places where Justice Alito gets it wrong, and I thought he'd fix it. I mean, I said in multiple public fora, he doesn't want to look like someone who doesn't actually know anything. Have you been to a state legislature before? No, Dyer? I mean, clearly. And, you know, just to be clear, um, it's not in my book blurbs, but Justice Alito calls me some hack. So um, uh, that's his name for me. So um, clearly, uh, I overestimated him. Uh, I thought, why would you produce 
a, a piece of doctrine rooted in bad law, bad medicine, bad science, bad history. When you have the opportunity, you know, for free, your clerks didn't manage to get it right, but here is the most eminent, you know, medical and, and uh, economic and historian, you know, world doing your work for you, and he changed nothing other than to take some pot shots uh, at uh, the concurrence and the dissent. So, like, to me, it's such a willful blindness. It's not even inserting the sentence, women will suffer, but, you know, pregnant people have uh, interests, but. It's that I don't care. <laughs> they just don't matter. And to me, that was beyond kind of trolling. It was a sort of reification of the idea that I can do this because I can do this. And it would have taken very little to hand it to Justice Barrett and say, sort of take a power wash, you know, run this through the sensitivity machine and make it read like at least I pretended to care about the interests of pregnant people. But he didn't. And to me, that was a real revelation because the answer is because they can't. And so, and because they don't care how it looks. And so, you know, throughout the course of the summer, when you were hearing male legislators say things like, if it's a legitimate rape, you know, then, then the body, you know, with all due respect, we're still hearing that, or, you know, uh, uh, talking about how it's absolutely not possible that uh, people who are miscarrying uh, could be implicated here, or it's not possible uh, for a 10-year-old to get pregnant. None of these things are possible in a world in which, I guess, you are, watch the Hallmark Channel and have no understanding how the, you know, human body works. So it seems to me that the, the, the short answer, which is becoming quite long, is that, um, <laughs> is that if you don't care to know what you don't know, if you are content to say, I know all I need to know about reproduction, then it is very easy to do exactly the thing that you're saying. And, and so just to Amy's point, um, it is our job to be writing the op-eds right now. It is our job to be speaking. It is our job. I said on Rachel Maddow that night, talked about my own miscarriage, uh, talked about what had to happen. I think we have to stand up and say, just to Polly Murray, this happens. This happens to all of us. This happened to me. This is going to happen to my children. And if we don't bring our truth into the story, then that's on us too. Yeah, and this stuff... In the face of a vacuum, this is what will fill the vacuum mm -hmm. if we don't. And I think what you've pointed out too is you mentioned in the book um, women holding up what, what you or maybe Stacey Abrams called the work of democracy. So the things that we're told are women's issues or personal or just about hygiene or our daily life. It's the work of democracy to tell these stories. I've been in the state legislatures where the things you're describing are now happening in the opinions. And the interplay of that means when we try to challenge the badly written law, we now have a judicial branch who's willing to ignore the badly written law and uphold it and not tell the truth about it. Um, and I think we're seeing both of those branches now yep. um, confront this idea of, of truth <laughs> yep. or not. Delegate, welcome. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> Let me say, Dahlia, we loved you when you were funny. We loved you when you were grumpy, but you're still funny. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Amy, thank you for all the work that you've done uh, for such a long time. In Are you calling me old? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just... I'll always be older than you. Um, my question has to do with the ru rule of law, because I'm very respectful of that, and I want to kind of get your sense of some dynamic that's happening out there now and how we frame it as following the rule of law. Several years ago, when you saw a number of people in these rural areas of the country declaring themselves to be part of se Second Amendment sanctuary jurisdictions where they were not going to uh, enforce the rule of law on guns. We were just incensed. One of the interesting things that happened right after Dobbs is 90 prosecutors around the country 
published an open letter saying that they would not prosecute women or doctors for violating the statutes in some of these wacko states uh, that uh, prohibit abortion. And, you know, in the first instance, I'm saying to myself, oh, my God, don't these people believe in the rule of law? But now we got this new thing, and I want to know how we frame that to say that these folks are actually supporting our view of the rule of law. And thanks very much for being here. There's always a ringer, huh? There's always somebody just knows You're a little too. You're the best. Too... If anybody can answer this no, question, it, it's got to be you. It, it is the hardest question, and it's, you know, as, a, as an institutionalist like yourself, nullification scares me, right? I mean, you should be scared when people say, I'm simply not enforcing this. So I, I have a slightly complicated answer, and... Um, I, when I get nervous, is isn't just prosecutors who say, I'm going to fail to enforce this. Uh, I get nervous with a whole strand of, and I've written this piece 30 times this year, of rewarding vigilantism. And I think that the Supreme Court this year, in, in a sort of strain of cases that I don't think gets nearly enough attention, it certainly starts with SB8 in Texas, right, where people are getting cash prizes for turning in anyone who aids and abets an abortion. But I think it's like Kyle Rittenhouse. I think it is the Supreme Court saying, never mind uh, what, uh, uh, you know, your school district says, go ahead and, you know, pray on the 50-yard line uh, because, you know, that's your sense of the law and that matters. And, and, and layered over that is a much scarier thing that I think is happening, which I've also written 30 times, which is the contempt that I hear in Justice Gorsuch's voice when he talks about, you know, CDC scientists who are trying really hard to frame national COVID, you know, policy in a lethal pandemic. And when he talks about, you know, the people who are giving out gun licenses in New York and how they're all in the tank for, you know, rich people and rock stars and the ways that they talk with contempt about the EPA, the ways they talk with contempt about that entire stratum of, you know, public servants who we should be on our knees thanking because they are extraordinary and they are working. And the idea, and this is part of the whole kind of challenge to the administrative state that we're seeing play out at the court, that anybody can just invent the law as they see fit and that that entire sort of superstructure of public servants that does their best to be lawful every day, uh, sometimes incorrectly, but does their best to do that, are just all a bunch of hacks. So everybody go out there and do what you want. That scares me. And so kind of folded into your question, I think is that like a much deeper for me, like exigent problem of what it means when you're deputizing every single person in the country to just choose your own legal ending. And the court is super on board with that. And that's why I'm doubly anxious about the kind of nullification you're describing. Here's what I would say. And I felt I had the same reaction you did. You know, my, my gut tells me we cannot be telling uh, prosecutors that the law isn't the law. And the way I think I'm coming down on this, and it's the answer to one of Amy's earlier questions about what do you do when the law is just broken, is to not give up on the law itself, but ask yourself, when is the law being deliberately corroded and corrupted for bad outcomes? And when it's being done so through processes that are not lawful. And I can do that. I can, and I realize that that may be just a trick. But in my mind, when you have, you know, through gerrymandered districts and, you know, massive rampant vote suppression, you have a legislature that is passing a law that is patently unconstitutional and wrong. I can live with saying the problem here is a lawless law and not nullification. And again, maybe that's just complete sophistry on my part, but I have to, you know, the way it comes up for me, and I'll finish here, is, you know, John Roberts saying last week, you know, oh, you know, there's no legitimacy problem with the court. The problem is those of you who just don't like outcomes. And my answer is, I don't like lawless outcomes. And that isn't my problem. 
that's your problem because whatever you are producing now is a lawless outcome. And I understand that that can be repurposed against outcomes that I like, like Obergefell, but I think that we are in a place now, particularly on reproductive rights, where Dobbs was so outlandishly lawless, so untethered from doctrine and precedent, stare decisis, and the promises that are made about stare decisis, that I can live with the idea that prosecutors say, this is not in fact a law, this is a thing that purports to be law that is just power. Great, thanks. Yeah. She just looked at me and said, is that right? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi, Dahlia. So I'd like to come back to compassion and empathy. And it kind of parallels the issues that you just covered because, and maybe you addressed this in your book, I haven't finished. Um, but what do you do with bullies who just don't care? Where do we go with our compassion and empathy? And I know that's a, you know existential question, but personally for you, how do you harness compassion and empathy when it comes to people who are harming, killing, people with their power, their lawless power. I, I mean, yeah, that's the one. Uh, and, I, and I think about it all the time. Um, you know, I have a couple of rules for myself as a journalist. I try not to bully. I try not to punch down, as we call it in journalism. Um, I try very, very hard to imagine what someone else is experiencing. That, and I do believe that much of the fury that we see now in politics, in discourse, in the culture is based in fear. I think people are terrified. And I think that we have a media and a political system that deliberately inflames that fear for money. And so one thing that I think is really important is to try to center at all times, and I know it's hard, and trust me, like, my hate mail is scary, but is to try to center that people are afraid. And that when Ron DeSantis says that people are coming to, you know, harm your children from foreign countries, um, people believe that. And that's a, a failure of leadership, not necessarily a failure of moral character for everyone. And maybe the last thing I will say, and this is eminently unsatisfying, even less satisfying than my gymnastics about nullification and rule of law. Uh, you know, Polly Murray at the end of uh, their life leaves the law and uh, is ordained as a priest and writes and thinks in terms of kind of a higher moral <laughs> calling than even the law. And this is the same Polly Murray who had already seen in their lifetime immense change, and it still wasn't enough. And so I do think that there is a place <laughs> for that which is the best part of spirituality, and it doesn't, you don't have to be ordained um, in any faith, and you don't even have to have a faith. But that ability, I think, to see beyond what is and to see what could be and to see like what I think is a divine spark in everyone, I think that that takes you a long way. It makes me super sad that Polly Murray did not find it in the law because Amy and I do, I think, still, on our best days. You can just ask say me, no. Ask me in March. <laughs> But I think I think that there there is a place for um, the empathy that comes with faith. Mm -hmm. There's that um, Baldwin quote: "You must accept them and accept them with love." Yep. Just quick follow up. I think we all know um, Donald Trump is afraid, but do you think Ron DeSantis is afraid, and what is he afraid of? He's probably afraid of Donald Trump. I mean, <laughs> just saying. Uh, yeah, I think that a lot of very, very small men 
are terrified of losing power. Everything that Amy said about hegemonic control of power, of money, of the levers of government, the idea that people that don't look like them, that don't follow their you know, notions or values, I think is terrifying. And I think that Ron DeSantis is very, very afraid that when Amy and I run the world, uh, which we will, you know, that, that there's no place for him. And I am here to say, I think we're trying to make place for everyone. And I think that that is an act of deep love. When we run the world, it will be unionized, though. Too, so. It will be unionized, and, uh, and all books will be pink. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think we have I'm Kavi one. Hoffman. Um, I am an officer in Charlottesville, uh, Virginia, and National Organization for Women. And thanks to Polly for helping us start that. Um, I'm here to... Uh, present an opportunity. Um, we are at a moment in time that I think is critical, and so I'd like to invite you to the opportunity to call Senator Leader Schumer and our two senators to ask them to ask Leader Schumer to bring uh, the Equal Rights Amendment time limit, the Senate Joint Resolution Number One, the House already passed it, uh, Joint Resolution 17, to a vote before the midterms. And uh, yesterday, the archivist had their um, review, I guess. Uh, to, uh, next Wednesday, I would love to see you at the rally in front of the um, court in DC at uh, 333 Constitution. Um, and I wonder, uh, you know, I, I still believe that legislators are looking to us to let them know. And after months, we had a meeting with um, Leader Schumer's staff and um, Cardin's staff last Friday. And they basically asked for three things. One, Republican senators to vote. And we said, well, given what they've been told and who they are, we thought that was a little difficult. And two, to call our state senators and ask them to please call Schumer and tell him to bring this to a vote. And I would invite all you in the room to please do this every day until elections. <laughs> and to call Schumer himself and talk to his staff. And thank you, and I would love your insight and possibly your commitment. Thank you. Thanks for that. that to, to bring it back to Lady Justice, that just reminds me of um, you talking about Anita Hill and people asking her, you know, do you regret um, doing all of that? And her saying basically and internalizing if I didn't, you know, what would happen if you weren't there? What would happen if you hadn't done that? Yeah, and I, and I think um, I unfortunately am on a book tour, so I, I won't, I'm sorry, um, be there, but I will say I think you've just done what I think is the last mm -hmm. line in the book, which is, I'm going to get this my shirt, uh, women plus law equals magic, and that we are going to have to um, step in to a very scary, uncomfortable place, a place that is very jerry-rigged against us, and step into a place and have really difficult structural imbalance conversations with, um, with our leadership. And essentially, I think that we can do that. We were born to do that. And um, I invite all of you, and I thank you for the question, I invite all of you to ask yourself, what more do I need to know what do I need to read? What do I need to learn? Who do I need to listen to? But I can't, I can't not do this work anymore. So I thank you very much for the question. And I think Amy and I want to say thank you to all of you um, yeah. for really, really showing up for women and law 
and justice and dignity and equality. And Dahlia. And Amy. <laughs> and we thank you. I have, I have very good news for all of you guys. The night is not yet over. I'm about to tell everyone how to go catch up with um, Dahlia and Amy to get your book signed. And I'm also going to tell you how to catch up with Josh, if you haven't met him, to uh, have him talk about his campaign a little bit too. Before I do that, bear with me for literally less than two minutes of housekeeping, just quick stuff that's really important for you to know. First thing, this is the book I was supposed to show you for those who hadn't seen it already. Uh, yes, so uh, I, I did have one direct question of my own, uh, if I can. When you guys are on the campaign to run the world, can you make frequent stops in Charlottesville and do this again? As long as there's cheese. I keep trying to leave. You, you probably could have held out for more than that, but we, we'll get you cheese. So anyway, less than two minutes, I promise. Um, the ushers, as you're going out, the ushers will guide you kind of around either side to where the book signing and where Josh, actually Josh is going to be in front as you exit, and the book signing, and, and you, there's still books to purchase, are behind. So that's got my ge uh, geometry mixed up there. Um, early voting, has been mentioned, does start tomorrow. And tomorrow we have two events going on. Josh only mentioned one of them, I think, which is the 10 a.m. Uh, at the Free Speech Wall. And uh, several VIPs as well as Josh are going to be there. Sally, Delegate Sally Hudson, who's here, is going to be there. <laughs> so you will not want to miss that in, unless you're working. And but. Some of you look like you might be feeling a little sick, a little ill, so may maybe you can come anyway. Uh, the second event, though, is at 4 o'clock. There's a happy hour at uh, Star Hill Brewery in the Dairy Market Building. So that's going to be fun. Bring a friend, have a beer. Um, I think there's an arrangement where if you vote, you can maybe get a free beer, but I, I don't know all the details of that, but I'm serious. Um, our, the, the next event in our speaker series is Tuesday, October 11th. And it's also going to start at 6.45 p.m. And the speaker is going to be UVA Law Professor and MacArthur Genius Award winner and personal friend of Dahlia. So you know, you know, all three of those are good reasons to come. Um, so uh, Danielle Citron is going to be talking about her new book, The Fight for Privacy, Protecting Dignity, Identity, and Love in the Digital Age. And she's going to be in conversation with Professor UVA history professor William Hitchcock. Uh, so privacy invasions of our personal lives are a real danger to all of us, but particularly dangerous to women now in states where abortion is legal and all the other kinds of stuff that these guys were just talking about. So thanks to everyone who did the work for this event, the ushers, the, the folks who designed the, the flyer, the folks at PVC have been wonderfully, wonderfully nice. Really appreciate that. So now I think the event's kind of over. Uh, please come back and catch Dahlia and Amy and chat and meet Josh and chat with him. And Edgar Lara from Sin Barreras is tabling tonight. You can talk with him about what's going on in the Latinx community. Thank you very much for coming out.